Hi, my name is Musharraf Khan and I'm an editor of Cafe de Census. Today we are here to speak to Professor Jagdish Bhagbati, who doesn't need any introduction. He's the University Professor of Law and Economics at Columbia University and Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, a renowned expert on international trade. He has served in top-level advisory positions for the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. His most recent book is Why Growth Matters, How Economic Growth in India Related Reduced Poverty and the lessons for other developing countries. And this he co-authored with Professor Arvind Panagaria. And this was selected as a best book of 2013 by the Financial Times. Uh, Professor Bhagwati, thank you very much for talking to us. Uh, I'll start with, the, with uh, the first question on your difference of opinion with uh, Professor Amartya Sen. You two seem to be having very different conceptions of growth in Indian economy. Uh, you wholeheartedly embrace market-oriented economy and you uh, advocate deregulation, whereas Professor Sen seems to be advocating that the government should play some active role in certain social sectors like health, education, employment, generation, and things like that. Uh, between Congress and BJP, uh, would you say that Congress follows Professor Sen's model and the BJP follows your sort of a model? Or the story is much more complicated than that. Well, I'm the initial statement that you made, uh, which is that I'm supporting markets and he's supporting social expenditures. I mean, that's just plain wrong. Uh, the finance minister of India, Mr. Um, Chidambaram, said somewhere uh, <clears throat> that Professor Bhagwati has passion for growth and Professor Sen has compassion for the poor. So I said, you're, you're, you know, you've gotten it wrong because I have passion for growth because I have compassion for the poor. Mm -hmm. And where Professor Sen is, in my opinion, totally wrong is in thinking that somehow compassion for the poor translates into sensible policy to remove poverty. So this is at the heart of it. You see, I started out working on poverty reduction in 1961 when I went back from abroad. And so my job was to actually how to bring up the bottom 30% of the poor into gainful employment and minimum standard of living. Professor Sen never even thought about that problem in those days. Uh, you know, I mean, he thought about lots of other things, and he's a very good economist. But on poverty, he's impoverished, in my opinion, because he really didn't have anything going for him. Now, how does growth figure, you see? So I would say that we, were interested and you know in the planning commission in the early 60s and certainly you know from the first five-year plan uh, the notion was that we were so poor that a simple solution like dispossessing the rich and redistributing the income to the poor was unlikely to work or produce any sustainable results mm -hmm. and was mainly that we have too many poor and too few rich so this is something where if Professor Sen, I mean, there's one difference now, which is that he claims half the time that somehow we could have redistributed income to, to the poor and we could have actually generated growth. My view, right from the beginning and throughout the whole period was, has been that, and this is where actually uh, a communist economist actually, Professor Kileski, he was passing through India thanks to Professor Malinobis, you know, who was a planner, another Bengali like you. Uh, and so he was, you know, a great figure. And so he used to bring all these guys. So Professor Kalecki, who was actually returning to Poland and unfortunately went straight into the arms of anti Semitism. But he was a great figure. So he got hold of me when I was in the planning commission in 1962. And he said, Bhagwati, because they can't say Bhagwati, as you know. Uh, so Bhagwati, you know, the problem with your country is that there are too many exploited and too few exploiters. Now by this, I mean, uh, that's Marxist language, right? But what he meant was redistribution could not take you very far. You might get the poor people who are so many in India, you would give them another chapati a day, maybe a little more chili and, you know, stuff like that. So how, what do we do about it? Right? If we don't have redistribution as a way to do it, right away, we have to generate the resources for doing all the social spending. 
which the redistribution presumably would enable us to do. So if you want to have social spending, unless you believe in God, which I don't think Professor Sen does, <laughs> so there's no manna going to fall from heaven. Right. And he doesn't believe, well, at least at that time he did believe, now he's probably <laughs> a creature of the American imperials. Because it, that enables you to prosper in this country, uh, to go go along, you know. So maybe he can probably get money from USAID, but they now don't have any money either, mm -hmm. right? As you know, you live in this country. So how are you going to finance it? And he had no solution at all, none at all. And so this is my first difference is that it's not enough to talk about poverty. We all did. I mean, you know, you have to be ghoulish, as they say, meaning like Frankenstein or Dracula or something, or a Godzilla, you know, the Japanese monster, to, to say that you, you know, you don't care for the poor. Of course we all, and this is why, so I think the, that's one main difference. That is where I, my feeling is that he was never really for growth. He wrote to the, <laughs> an angry letter to the economist saying, I had two, two books on growth. Well, I mean, first, he's already said that he's against growth, <laughs> obsession. Forget it. Let bygones be bygones. But now he's coming around and saying he likes growth. I mean, and his evidence is that he, he had two books on growth. But the joke is that you're a student of English literature, right? <laughs> so you don't do this sort of stuff. But after the, you know, after the war, all of us were doing growth models because the static models had gone. But the question really is, were you using growth models to show how it would affect poverty? That's the issue, not whether you were doing a growth model. Right. So this is why it, I find it difficult. I think the real issue is, can he show, I mean, the, and I don't think he can, that we could have spent a fair sum of money in the 50s and uh, mid-60s before growth began to take off and then, uh, I mean, after, after 80s and 90s, it was much easier to do social spending because you generated revenues, right. you see. So, so that is where if you then do an exercise, like supposing how much have we done by way of that kind of spending on, say, education. And if we take that and say, if we had tried to do that much in 1960, what would have happened? You would have had to spend something like 30% of your GNP or GDP on education. Where would you get that kind of money from? You see, so these are the real nitty-gritty issues. Uh, and in my judgment, if he now says, uh, you know, I, I'm for growth, fine, come over to my side, but be graceful and say, I got that point from Professor Bhagavati. But even if he doesn't give me credit, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You know, to me, that is the, that's the issue today. But everything has been obfuscated by these personal personalizations and so on. And we are not uh, uh, young people like you who are not necessarily economists. But we you have an need interest. To be, but you have because this next election yeah, exactly. is going to be about economics, and we can discuss uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But we'll move to the question of growth because that's right. something you're right. very keen on, and you have right. written a lot right. about. Right. Uh, in fact, even in your new book, you talk about growth and how it can pull up the poor and you have given extensive statistics and yeah, for analysis. India, definitely, yeah. Exactly. But if, uh, the question is if growth is a panacea for reducing poverty, why hasn't it really worked uh, even in a state like Gujarat where Mr. Uh, Narendra Modi is the chief minister? Because we have some, uh, we have impressive growth for Gujarat but Indian Human Development Report 2011 states that in Gujarat, 44.6% of the children below the age of five suffer from malnutrition. Nearly 70% of the children in the state suffer from anemia. Even a recent UNICEF report uh, states, and I quote from the report, social development indicators have not been able to keep pace with economic development in the state, unquote. And it also cites uh, malnourished children, undernourished mothers, uh, skewed uh, sex ratio, despite having improvement in child sex ratio. Uh, how do you explain such an anomaly in a state which is uh, growing so fast? It's very easy because <laughs> this again, this is where also Professor Sen, whom you mentioned, is confused because you have to distinguish an economic analysis between levels 
and change in the levels. Now when you look at Gujarat, it inherited from the past, and that's a separate question, why was that so low? Uh, we, it inherited very bad performance indicators on, on, on these social issues. If you look at the change that has been made in the last 15 years, Gujarat turns out, I, I was myself surprised because at one stage uh, I refused to go after 2002 to receive a major award which actually uh, Ratan Tata and Mukesh Ambani went to get. But I would not go because, you know, I'm, I'm that kind of cussed fellow uh, who has to have integrity. I don't coast along with whatever <laughs> is going on. So I didn't go because uh, six months after the, event, uh, the, uh, the communal violence, nothing was clear and, you know, I didn't want to go and de facto endorse what had happened. This time I went two years ago or less than two years ago because I was asked to go by Narendra Modi to give a talk on what we can learn from Gujarat and what we can teach Gujarat. Then I was quite astonished. On the first differences, Gujarat was doing extremely well and that is in the book also. Mm -hmm. So when I went there, I, I really was surprised and I was not totally surprised for two reasons. Uh, because on the first differences, there's no question that Gujarat has done very well. Uh, Kerala, the she people. But anyway, the point is, this was the case that I found uh, for Guj Gujarat. And I have two explanations for that. One is Narendra Modi comes from an OBC. Uh, this is for the Indian market, right? Yeah, so the, he's an OBC. He's come up from the ground level, absolutely. And to the point where Manishankar Iyer said the chap should be running a, a stall, tea stall. And I would say, since I love Gujarati mas masala chai, that money should go and partake of that <laughs> if he really wants to, 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 to talk about Gujarati tea. But anyways. You, you would explain uh, this kind of anomaly by saying that it, had been, it has been inherited from the past gov governments in Gujarat. Yes, that's the first point. But why is it that the first difference is so high? That's what I, we have to explain. So one reason is I think that Modi himself uh, grew up having seen the poverty right in it. Secondly, all these guys <coughs> who know nothing about anything that they're talking about in our Indian debate, <coughs> they don't realize that Gujarat is <coughs> the land of Gandhiji. It is a land of Jain and Vaishnav religions, uh, all of which are <coughs> oriented towards helping the poor. Right? Supposing if he becomes a prime minister, I'm sure you would ask me that. I would say that he's going to bring to society at the level of Delhi a firm dedication to which is part of his cultural upbringing. Right? Nothing artificial about that, in my opinion. I mean, I spent five hours with him. I didn't feel a whiff of anything <coughs> communal or anything. Actually, some people had said, don't talk about retail. <laughs> uh, you know, Walmart, etc., because the BJP is against all that, right? right. So I, we are going to ask question on that. Yeah, That's but right. I still did. He doesn't apply any censorship at all. You know, in many cases you have to be careful, like you don't tell Sonia Gandhi something or somebody else. I'm mean, straightforward politicians, you know, as against. But this guy, I was taken aback. I mean, he was a Gujarati par excellence in terms of the culture of giving, right? And this is why I, you, it's not a surprise to me at all that he's really managed to do on the social indicators of things. So you, you can, your, your so you can... So you don't necessarily agree with the statistics that, we have, that has been put out No, there. those are average statistics. Mm -hmm. You see, average statistics are, of course, Gujarat has not done well. But that is not the issue. But you also can counter-argue by saying that one segment of Gujaratis have done very well, especially the middle no, class. No, that doesn't follow. It's right. only the first difference, meaning the change in something that you have to look at. And there, the social indicators show, first, poverty has actually fallen dramatically, which is a straightforward indicator, but also social indicators, education, literacy, all that sort of stuff, you know. So I think that is what we need to do. And in our book, so we move to the next question. Again, uh, recently you wrote a letter with Professor Arvind Pandaria to The Economist where you claim that 
the violence in Gujarat in 2002 was well, not a pogrom, it was the actually second a, letter, yeah. Right. It was actually a riot. And I quote from your letter where yeah, you said, yeah. but what you call a pogrom was in fact a communal riot in 2002 in which a quarter of the people killed right. were Hindus, right. 170 of them from bullets fired by the police, unquote. Right. Recently, a journalist, Hartosh Singh Bal, has written uh, on an online portal in India that actually, if you do a calculation, you'll find 80% of them, those who were killed, were Muslims. So only 20% were actually Hindus. I'm not getting into that debate. But that's all. a, I mean, minor variation. This yeah, that's what we call. I mean, it's within the range of error. Right. So, so I'm, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't. That status. Unless he said 80% were Hindus and 20. But right. that's not true. So <laughs> we are not saying. We anything. are not interested in statistics because human no. tragedy cannot be measured by no. statistics in the first but, place. But what it does show is that the police were brought into fire against the Muslims. Right, so you mean to say that... Who were actually assaulting the Muslims. Right, so the administration was actually alert and they had sent the police. That's well, what well, that's what the Supreme Court uh, report, which is about oh God, no, so 600 pages or something, mm -hmm. it does point out, which surprised me a great deal, which was that Narendra Modi had come in six months only when this broke out. Mm -hmm. uh, and according to that report, I'm told by many people who have read it, I haven't read it, uh, apparently asked for the army to be sent in, but it took three days before the army could arrive. Mm -hmm. And since then, I mean, I've looked everywhere uh, because I wouldn't go in 2000 and then uh, two years ago unless I'd satisfied myself that I didn't want to support something, you know, which, because secularism is very important and communal peace and so on, at least to me. Uh, and so I think the um, the uh, I looked through quite a few speeches, and Professor Panagari has looked through several. There's no evidence of his showing any animus towards the Muslims, or even the Christians for that matter. Uh, and one interesting thing, which is worth speculating about, I mean, you know, we'll have to set, engage in all this during the election with what, next three, four months? Yeah, in April. Yeah, and so uh, I think the number of the uh, communal violences, because Gujarat has traditionally had riots and so on. There's not been one since the 2002. Is it because now Modi is more because he's not pushing? Careful that this yeah. might have a negative image. On well, no, I mean that that makes it instrumental policy, a, a tactic or a shrewd. I don't think. I mean, there's not a. Uh, he never says anything like. Uh, this is for this community or that community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not the way he seems to think. And uh, he believes, much like uh, I do, that uh, not, not totally, but at least one part, which is that if you offer opportunity to people, a lot of them will grab it. And it doesn't matter whether they're Muslims or mm -hmm. Dalits and so on and so forth. But whether he believes in affirmative action is a different matter, because that is a way of supplementing what you do through growth. Uh, so just shifting the question a little bit from right. economics to sure. social security issues, despite having growth uh, and despite uh, tremendous growth in Gujarat and in other parts of India, we have seen that there is an assertive Hindu right in India who have often targeted Muslims and Christians uh, around India. So does economic growth actually guarantee social security and personal freedom of people? Because we need, it looks like, what Professor yeah. Sen claims, uh, the capability approach, that it's not just e economic growth that can sustain personal freedom. There has to be something else. Do you think if... Like uh, what? Uh, some Is kind of secu really? security to life that I'm, I won't be attacked I can, I can talk about it. Security to property. I can talk about it for hours. He's a man with slogans with no policies. Right. So my question here... I'm, I'm all for all this. I was for poverty eradication. But he just talked about it. Increased it by through bad policy. Yeah, but I don't. We don't. I, <laughs> so we don't no, get into that debate saying, anymore. Yeah. No, no. But this is what I'm saying. My worry about people who talk, you know, forget him, but people who talk about secularism, is that you have to have concrete policies. So now, uh, in my view, the way to do it, for instance, I'll give you an example. No, I just was asked a question about, yeah. about Mr. Modi. If Mr. Modi comes to power, he becomes a prime minister. Do you think he can? ensure social security for the vulnerable segments of society, like the minorities especially. But he's already done that in Gujarat. Uh, 
you you claim to say yeah, so I okay but so you have read my book right and you, so book. you have confidence that he can do it in the center as yes, well yes because it's not a an ounce of criminalism about the guy that i can detect maybe he's a very clever shrewd character <laughs> but i i don't think he's machiavellian like that <laughs> and besides people like you you and you know and lots of others will be watching it right i mean so and, and we need to all the politicians because if we look at like who was I, the same program is what you mentioned i mean that was a really violent thing and you know it's, it's something ram kuha etc also everybody has written about it we put it under the carpet because we were all for congress <laughs> traditionally and never for bjp yeah no, we so, don't condemn that by condemning this No, no, both should be condemned. So condemned, one of the yeah. proposals which I have been floating is that what we need is uh, something like a truth commission, but not, I wouldn't call it truth commission. That's a very Christian concept, you know. Like we reveal the that, truth, yeah. we accept our guilt, you know. I mean, we, we are not into <laughs> advancing guilt <laughs> complex. <laughs> the, these guys do, right? We, we just, I mean, that's a very Christian, I mean, Bishop Tutu sort of thing. but what we do need i think is to say look let's pick out the top cases where really nasty things happen one is the gujarat 2002 the other is the anti six or 1984 there must be a couple like wiping out of the khalistanis right i mean that was pretty rough naxalite i mean <laughs> that was they were wiped out yeah it was a mutual thing bad. also yeah. but these are four big ones which i would say let there be a commission of impartial people mm -hmm. human rights oriented and let's see determine it and sort of selectively going after if i don't like bjp i go after 2002 if i don't like congress i go after that is not the way to do it so first we have to say look it happens uh, in a country of our size it's impossible to avoid altogether uh, my view is that you all want to judge a society by what it does when something breaks out not by <laughs> whether it prevents it because a country of our size how can you prevent anything look at the what's right it's it's a matter of how you respond that matters you see so that has to be strengthened first let's take an even handed approach rather than a, an approach which makes people cynical like you 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 don't care about this group you care about <laughs> that group i I'm think that has to be interject then do you support something like a communal violence bill in the parliament which most of the political parties are opposing at the moment because this will hold the higher officials accountable during moments of violence right like a dm could be prosecuted if he actually allowed yeah i haven't thought about it but okay. maybe but it's the sort of thing one should probably look at the only problem is you got to put it into the context of our culture like when the whole the bureaucrats are continuously being hounded and the politicians will blame the bureaucrats rather than themselves so we have to worry about the way something will be planted you see you can think of an institution but the institution has to be planted in the soil and then it begins to change you see uh, and so i think this is why I, th i wouldn't go down that route too much but but it's worth thinking about these are the kinds of things we need to think about very definitely and i think the um uh it is number one issue and i would say that the uh i'm a little bit more optimistic about uh narendra modi because he's been continuously attacked for being communal whereas the congress has got off <laughs> despite shrabano case and even now in up why should yeah. there be communal violence against muslims in up it's clearly the congress and that uh, what is it the, the socialist party whatever so much body party yeah. though bjp has been again condemned i mean accused of fomenting but my there. feeling is so, so we'll let's, into let's that. be a yeah. little bit cynical sometimes and say this is obviously being done with a view to say ah oh, that narendra modi you see <laughs> in fact amit shah has been held responsible to an extent but it's like a bilwal's khichdi i mean you <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> we'll we'll get, get, can get can that. from gujarat to madhanam modi for and rights you be it just doesn't make sense no so a little as i said uh, uh, the smell test has to be applied the second thing where I'm, you know which people worry about uh, is that he will go after pakistan mm -hmm. on the other hand 
the guy who opened up China was a Republican, namely <laughs> Nixon. So, <clears throat> and so far, again, I've checked with people, but it may, may have been missed. He has not come out saying that we should be belligerent towards Pakistan. And it's conceivable, like Prime Minister Vajpayee, who kind of initiated the thing, that he will actually, he may be our, uh, paradoxically, you know, he may be a, a good for uh, doing this, because if, if the Congress does it, <laughs> then there will be all kinds of disturbances. But if the BJP does it, Congress can't go after it for that. Right. So we'll move to the next question. We'll come back to economics again. And yeah. Uh, we, we don't have About much 15, time. 20 minutes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have advocated in the past that retail chains like the Walmart should be allowed in India. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that the farmers can have access to the yeah. international market. But then BJP itself had opposed uh, that kind of policy. I know. Uh, so do you think if Mr. Modi becomes prime minister, next prime minister, that this sort of reform process would be speeded up in India? Do you see I, a possibility I of that? I think so. In the follow it depends on whether it's a coalition government, I mean, the structure of the government will make a lot of, I'm, I'm uh, if BJP is going to get in, I would root for a clear verdict. Mm -hmm. So then we, he, he has no excuses not to do these things. But I think there are two problems. One is our reaction to, to this uh, is largely determined by people who are looking at Walmart experience abroad. So Walmart in the United States is an importer. Mm -hmm. So they, the, so the middle class, you know, upper and upper middle class who don't <laughs> shop at Walmart, we, we go to other places, you see, uh, and so they think of it as creating job losses, mm -hmm. you see, through import competition. Uh, in India, it's the other way around. Uh, it's not that they're going to be major importers. Uh, <laughs> we, we are not an open system anyway. There's still a lot of tariffs and barriers and, and 30 percent will have to yeah but, but that's a that's standard a kind of thing we do mm -hmm. anytime we make a change we put <laughs> spokes in the wheel we are not able to take a decision which is a clean one so I'm not very happy about that but mm -hmm. leave that out the point I'm making is that a lot of small farmers included will profit from the export potential opened up by Pepsi and by Walmart etc two I think the Congress, I don't know if they realize this, again a cultural point, because, and that's what I picked up from an Ambedkar program here, which is that many of the middle level uh, chaps, retailers, are upper, uh, upper caste people. That's what, where the caste system comes in. So the lower level people like Dalits, etc., who want to open little shops and so on, they can't do it because these guys are <laughs> sitting on their head. But if Walmart, etc., come in, then they get a place in the sun. How is that? Because they, they can become the be suppliers. Suppliers, exactly. That's how it really works. And so the, <laughs> the Congress should have been should be using that point rather than. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm, I'm not a politician. So, but I think. Uh, if you can show that the Dalits can do better, I can be sure that, I mean, given my evaluation of Narendra Modi, that he's generally interested in uplifting the masses, including Muslims and Christians, that he will actually do it. Uh, what do we move to the next question? We don't have much time, so we right, have yeah. to go for our class. Uh, next question is on social spending, though we, you have already yeah. spoken about it, but still I thought I would just sure. ask this question. And you said in, in a recent interview, and I quote from that interview, that in countries such as India, Indonesia, Brazil, and China, right, right. where there are many poor and few rich, yeah, social spending or redistribution was not a sensible program for aiding the poor, unquote. Uh, my question here is, if BJP comes to power, do you see that it's continuing the social spending programs of the UPA government that is continuing at the moment? Uh, the two problems. Because there is no, no, there are, no, there are two problems with that. You see, I, I distinguish between two types of populism. Populism as an objective, meaning I'm for the people, meaning for the poor, and populism as a strategy, which is really disastrous. Right. So policies have to be well thought through to deliver for the poor. So I, when someone says a you know, program is populist, I said distinguish between its objective and its techniques. And now, in my judgment, the problem is uh, 
the following. Uh, in our book, we say, and we still maintain, as I said, nothing, none, all the calculations we have done, like on education, there's no way we could have really spent the kinds of monies we are doing now uh, for the last 10, you know, five to seven years at least, uh, for social spending like health, education, etc., for the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> that has been made possible because the rapid growth, since the advantage of rapid growth is that at any given tax rate, it generates more revenues, which everybody accepts now. So it comes effortlessly. If you have to raise taxes, you know, I, I would like his taxes to go up, but not mine. <laughs> and this is a standard problem in democratic societies. So people are hesitant, you see. <clears throat> and Monsieur Hollande in Paris is <laughs> discovering that. He's had to back off for a chap. You know, I mean, uh, so I think the um, that money enabled us to mount more substantial programs without any trouble, mm -hmm. right? Whether it was wise or not is another. I think it is a good thing to spend money on social spending. You see, you have, therefore, less com money coming in. On the other hand, because of the election and because, you know, Jean Dres and the people around, Sonia Gandhi, you know those, uh, the NGO, they want more and more spending. And, and they were misled into believing I mean the Sonia Gandhi group and so on, that some, the way to win the election is to have more social spending. Because that's what they think happened the previous time when they moved in and <laughs> BJP was bundled up. So that is their mindset, you see. Because each one goes by the previous experience. But this time, since the money is not coming in and you're spending more, what is going to happen? You don't, you don't need any macroeconomics, right? Even you can see yeah, it right away. Can and see even it. I, because I'm not a macroeconomic expert. But this is elementary. So what is happening now? And this is what worries me about the UPA. <laughs> My good friend, <laughs> Dr. Manmohan Singh of 60 years, is, is still the prime minister. I mean, he's associated with all this. So it is something where once inflation occurs, we know two things. The poor get hurt because poor don't have index-linked contracts, meaning as prices go up, their wages <laughs> and the farms go up. doesn't happen. They don't have contracts. <laughs> so all econometric studies show poor get into trouble during inflation. The other thing is middle class like us. I mean, I'm the lower middle class is in trouble. Already there's inflation and that is going to lead to more inflation. So it's one. And therefore, my fear is that the <laughs> Congress party or UPA is going to lose. And now I think they're distancing themselves from people like Professor Sam. They never mention him now. And so on. No, because, you know, when you invoke a big name, it immediately creates uh, vibes in your, you know. But now they, they're not. Uh, because I think finally the point has gotten through. And I think now it's, it's going to de depend very much on um, whether, uh, you see, as we keep spending this money uh, in a way which is dangerous, both for economics and politics as a result of the, of the incumbent party. You see that 